Hi. Let's start with a quick show of hands. Who's ever tried to build a storage system that would need to scale to, say, a couple of petabytes of data? I actually see a couple of hands. That's great. All right, now, now keep your hands up and keep keeping your hands up if you feel like you have succeeded in that endeavor. I see actually one hand. Okay, uh, keep your hand up if you're not from Netflix. <laughs> awesome. I'd like to talk to you more about uh, after this. But um, I don't know if you noticed we had just very few hands up, and I, mine wasn't there either uh, at the second part. So it turns out this is an extremely hard problem, and we totally failed in doing that. So um, why we are here today is to share with you a couple of learnings on. Um, how we are still in business after having failed that. Uh, so I will tell you about three uh, fundamentally different use cases we have in production of S3. Uh, that will be around 25 minutes, all things considered. And then uh, after that, uh, yeah, I will hand the presentation over to Tomás, who will tell you more about how we built our uh, self-service big data stack on S3 and related services. Uh, after that, we will ideally have around 10 minutes for questions, but feel free to reach out to us in Twitter, in email, even LinkedIn, and uh, for the questions at the end, we have two microphones set up there. So, to give you a little context on where we are coming from, what's, what's Prezi? Prezi is essentially the product is essentially what you see here on the screens behind me. It's a presentation software. What's maybe more, uh, more relevant for this session here is what kind of scale we are talking about in this, uh, in this storage scenario. So we have uh, over 75 million users worldwide who have created over 280 million presentations. Uh, and this whole thing is supported by around 100 engineers. Now those engineers, uh, are split across a number of platforms. The 100 engineers include Android developers, include web front-end developers, and we have maybe 10 people working on infrastructure. And then, since we're here to talk about S3, let's see how these numbers translate to S3. We store petabytes of data in essentially as many buckets as we can get our hands on. We have uh, millions and millions of uploads and downloads every day we generate a ton of uh, bandwidth as well. And this whole traffic, this whole usage is generated by, as I mentioned, uh, four very different use cases, one of which uh, Tomás will talk about in the second half, second half of this talk, which are the blue circles on the right, and the other three we're going to cover in a minute. But um, first, I'd like to talk a bit about why these are different use cases at all. So we have two, uh, two big axes. We have object count and we have object size. And uh, we have, on the one hand, presentation XMLs, which are tiny, tiny XML files that describe the structure and content of the presentation, uh, maybe a few kilobytes at most. And uh, for each presentation, we have one. Actually, for each presentation, we have many of them because we'll have one object in S3 for each version of the presentation that's been saved. So in the end, that comes out to billions of objects stored in S3. Uh, on the bottom right, we have media files, which each presentation will have a couple of media files, you know, not, not hundreds usually. But these files are huge compared to the tiny XMLs that we are talking about uh, previously. And then finally, we have infrastructure secrets, which are small. So what, I, what do I even mean by an infrastructure secret? Password to a database, authentication passwords for cross-service communication, stuff like that. Uh, these are not that numerous, uh, but uh, they need to be stored in very different ways from, uh, I don't know, you know, cat pictures is the usual example. So uh, I want to encourage you that if you think about uh, how your storage system works, how your story works, uh, to understand the different kind of use cases. In our case, these are the big production ones. And um, let's dive in. First one is about these presentation XMLs. Each presentation will have a numeric ID, which is an auto-incremented field somewhere in some MySQL database. And as I, we edit your presentation, the version increases numerically as well. So 
this comes out again to billions of objects, and uh, to store these billions of objects efficiently, we need to help S3 somewhat. Uh, and how do we do that? We do that by having uh, balanced prefixes of the paths of our objects. Uh, so what the, how we achieve this uh, is we take the two last digits of the numeric ID of the presentation, we flip them around and just use this as the first two characters. This guy gives us essentially 100 buckets and sees these uh, IDs increment one by one. This gives us a nice even distribution across the 100 buckets. Uh, if you're just now designing your uh, new S3 layout, uh, the official best practices suggest generating a UUID for each of your objects and then you automatically get this property so you don't need, don't need to think about how to do this. Uh, and then the other thing we have down there is uh, the version number, which again, if you are just now setting up your uh, layout, you may want to consider using the versioning support of S3, so you don't need to save each version of your objects as individual objects. Uh, S3 has direct support for storing different versions of the same file. So that's so far so good. Uh, we could, in theory, even expose this directly to our users, uh, but that comes with a couple of drawbacks. Uh, this is essentially a no-go. Why is that? So first of all, this, these objects are identified by the numeric ID of the presentation, which opens us up to an enumeration attack. Totally don't want to do that. And worse, there's no way to authorize requests. So if you just open this up to uh, all our uh, client platforms, then you know, anyone can download essentially any presentation. We can't. We can't let that happen, so what we do instead is we have an EC2 service that we lovingly call storage proxy. Uh, and here, we can implement our own authorization, but what's more, we can implement any kind of logic that we need to, say, change the contents of these files on the fly. Uh, we can play around with maybe trying other storage backends. This gives us uh, many, many opportunities. And uh, the other thing to notice here is that we are not using the numeric IDs anymore. But instead, there's this thing called an OID, which is basically a random string that is the public identifier of each presentation. And suddenly, we have protected ourselves from enumeration attacks as well. So the takeaway here is, if you expect that you're going to store a lot of objects, then make sure that you have a balanced prefix of the paths of your objects. Uh, and you know, if you don't have a billion objects, you may still want to do it just in general principles. So that was the tons of relatively small objects use case. Now we're going to move on to the not that many, still quite a lot of bigger objects, uh, media files. So those are all the images, those are all the videos, those are the voiceovers that we have in our presentations. And uh, these, are, these are so big, actually, that in the end, uh, they come out to around two petabytes of storage, which gives rise to a couple of questions. Number one, how do we store two petabytes of data? Number two, how do we get this data to our users when they want to download and they, they want to present their presentations? Number three, it's my favorite, how are we going to pay for all this? So the storage question turns out to be pretty simple. You put it in S3, you're done. Of course, still keep in mind that you want to have balanced prefixes for your objects, but essentially S3 will take care of storing those two petabytes of data or much more. So that's easy. Uh, now then, moving on to delivering this content to the users. Since we have the media files on S3, and S3 has an HTTP API that you can enable for public access, you can just open that up and then we're done. It's simpy, simple, it works, and it's a terrible idea. Why? Uh, this is, this is what, we sh what we should be doing instead. Uh, and I'm going to tell you in a second why. Uh, so here the idea is that you use Amazon CloudFront as opposed to directly giving access to your S3 bucket to users. Uh, Amazon CloudFront is the CDN service of Amazon which integrates beautifully with S3. Uh, and once you set this up, you're going to see immediately around uh, 10 to 30% decrease in the price of transfer costs, which at first glance, can be surprising because we added another service. We are using more stuff, and we're still paying less. But the reason for that is that CloudFront is designed to get content to users. S3 is not designed to get content to users. So if we use it so, then essentially we're abusing S3. So we pay for that. Uh, and then the other thing is, of course, performance. See, the end is faster than anything else. 
da, no surprise. On the other hand, what was surprising for me uh, was that um, the very first time you access an object from S3 via CloudFront, it's still five to eight times faster than accessing it directly from S3. So going to CloudFront and then going to S3, that's faster than going directly to S3. Magic, I don't know. Um, yeah, so that makes the equation easy on the other hand because yeah, use CloudFront, that's it. Uh, especially if you expect that you'll have to serve a lot of bandwidth, but even otherwise. And one more thing, uh, you probably want to set up your own domain for uh, CloudFront because otherwise if you some, at some point decide that you want to switch over to another CloudFront distribution, then you won't be able to because you are tied to the domain name that was generated for your CloudFront distribution. So you want to set up your own domain and point it to the C name or maybe even an alias record to the CloudFront distribution's uh, DNS name. But then if you do this, it would maybe make sense to, uh, by default, just use the same domain that you use for the rest of your product. In our case, that would be present.com. But that's problematic for two reasons. Um, the core of the issue is that if you do this, then all the, all the cookies of your uh, users will travel to CloudFront every time they want to download an image. And I don't want to do this because one, if you don't need to, you shouldn't send around authentication tokens. Uh, and two, this takes up bandwidth, so you're losing some of, uh, some of the gains that you would otherwise get from CloudFront. And of course, if you set up a dedicated domain, uh, then you will have to make sure that your enterprise customers who have uh, whitelisting firewalls allow access to this domain. Uh, and now, let's, um, let's do another little uh, game. Who did the presentation in the last month? One, two, okay, couple, okay, now keep your hands up. If you were done with the presentation, done creating the content of the presentation, let's say at least a day before the presentation. All of us, okay. At least a week before the presentation. At least a month, we're done, okay. Um, so this is an example of how uh, understanding your business can lead to insights that you can translate to infrastructure changes that you can then translate to saved costs. Uh, which, being here in Las Vegas, talking about money, uh, it, it's, it's, it, it feels right. And um, I, you know, I have a thing for money. It's, uh, it's, my, it's my little, my, it's, a, it's a thing. Uh, I have short-term savings, mid-term savings, long-term savings, and, and live off last month's uh, income and all that. And um, of course, I'm gonna approach AWS with the same mindset. And um, here, what we can do is, uh, we can explore uh, the storage classes provided by AWS S3. And by default, usually, we're gonna be using uh, the standard storage class, which there's nothing special. Uh, on the other hand, we have infrequent access, which is exactly what it sounds like. You are built differently. So when you access an object, so when you download an image, then you pay more than you would for standard storage. On the other hand, you pay less for just storing that object. So in our case, uh, since we saw that uh, presentations um, are generally you know, done uh, just a few weeks maybe after the presentation is created, and then we see uh, in the pattern of use of our users that um, those presentations, they just usually lie dormant forever afterwards. Mm. But then this means that the media files in these presentations, the images, they are also not downloaded. So we can move these media files into infrequent access using something called a lifecycle policy. On the S3 bucket, you can set up a lifecycle policy and tell AWS to automatically move files, objects, from, say, standard storage to infrequent access, let's say, three months after it's been uploaded. And then you can set up, if you want to, uh, further rules to move them on to uh, Glacier or what have you. So, okay, I keep saying saving. So what, what does that actually look like? What you see here is uh, the S3 cost of Prezi over time. The blue bars are the standard storage cost. The red bars are infrequent access. Uh, the green one that doesn't really change is the transfer cost. And the orange one I'm gonna talk about in a second. So what you see here is that in April this year, we enabled this lifecycle policy that moves 
uh, old media files into infrequent access, and we pretty much immediately realized the saving of 30% just by essentially clicking a few buttons. It's pretty impressive. Uh, on the other hand, notice the big orange thing, which is the cost of the initial migration. migration. So what do I mean by initial migration? Uh, so when you set up the lifecycle policy, after a while, AWS is going to realize that um, you have all these files that have been sitting there, and this lifecycle policy should apply to them because they have been uploaded more than, say, three months ago. So then it's just going to move all of them. And the way it does this is it makes calls to the AWS uh, S3 API, which is built as API cost, which is the orange part here. So summing all that up, if you have data that is accessed frequently, infrequently even, uh, make sure to move the data into infrequent access on S3, or even look into some of the other, uh, other storage classes. If it turns out that your data becomes accessed infrequently over time, then you can set up a lifecycle policy to uh, support you in this. And of course, don't be surprised by the cost of the initial migration. So those are, uh, those are the use cases where, uh, the biggest use cases where our users directly interact with S3 and uh, related services. And then the third use case I'm gonna tell you about is a bit different in that it's more in the background. It's about managing infrastructure secrets. So passwords to databases, um, credentials for cross-service communication, that kind of stuff. And we have a number of solutions for this right now in the industry. You have your HashiCorp vault, you have built-in solution for this in Kubernetes, you have the encrypted data bags of uh, Opscore Chef, and they all have different trade-offs, different integrations, different pros and cons. In our case, we have been using the encrypted data bags of Chef for years, and it's a great solution. But we realized that we want fine control over which servers can access which secrets. For instance, I do not want uh, the service that's responsible for presentation metadata to be able to read the emails of users from that database. And of course, for this, we're going to have a security group and network level rules to not allow access to the network level. But we also want to make sure that not even the, pass the password is not even available to that service. And that's really hard to do with encrypted data bags. On the other hand, we can do this with uh, S3 and another service called AWS KMS, Key Management Service. And that diagram, uh, there's a lot going on there, but uh, let, me, let me walk you through it, what's happening here. So I'm a server, uh, and I want to access that database. So I realize this, and I know that that database will need some password. So what I'm going to do, first, I'm going to go to S3 and ask S3 for uh, for the encrypted form of that password. S3, in our case, since we're using what's called client-side encryption, S3 will never even see the plain text version of that password. So S3 will do authorization based on the IAM role that I have previously assumed using my instance profile. And hopefully, if I have access to that specific secret, it's going to give me the encrypted form of the secret. So I take that, go back home, and then I go to AWS KMS and ask AWS KMS for the decryption key to this secret. Similarly, KMS will do authorization here, and hopefully I have access to the decryption key for this secret, and then it will give this to me, and then I go back home, and I put the two things together. Now I have the plain text format of this password, and I can go to the database and do my thing. So this uh, sounds like a lot of work, it's complicated, it's error prone, you need a lot of error handling, but it turns out that the official AWS SDK for Ruby, for example, has built-in support for this. Uh, for the long link there, you don't need to write it down. There will be a short link to the presentation at the end so you can, uh, you can get all this. So essentially, if we instantiate this S3 client class in Ruby, then by just calling put object or get object, we automatically get uh, the functionality that we saw uh, one minute ago, which is great, especially if you realize that we've been using Opscode Chef to manage our infrastructure, which happens to be mostly in Ruby. So this means that uh, if you just introduce a thin layer above accessing the encrypted data bags of uh, Chef and replace 
that access with calls to get object and put object, then suddenly, without having to change all of our cookbooks, we migrated to this scheme of uh, managing secrets. If you're not a Ruby person, if you're more on the Java side of things, the Java SDK also has support for this exact use case, and AWS also provides a very nice write-up on uh, how you would go about implementing this functionality in your yeah. application. And finally, uh, since at Prezi we are mostly a Python shop when it comes to backend services, we were also looking for this support in the Python SDK, uh, but it turns out it's not there. What we have instead is support for S3, support for KMS, and of course Python has great cryptographical libraries as well. So what we can do in just a couple of lines of code, what you see on the screen now is we can implement at the core of this logic, we can go to S3, we can fetch the objects, we can go to KMS, we can use the cryptographical libraries to decrypt the key that we need to decrypt. This is a little extra work. On the other hand, it does provide us access with uh, access to the secret management system that I showed you previously. So that was that was three use cases where we use Amazon S3 in production. Sometimes users access these things directly, sometimes through some layers of abstraction. Uh, and now I'm gonna hand over to Tomasz, who will tell you about what happens with all the data that's generated while all this is happening. So, hi everyone. It's half past five, and uh, pub crawl just started, and you are still here, thank you and nobody stood up, so thank you for that as well. So I'm Tomás, and uh, I'm the tech lead of the data engineering team at Prezi. And, uh, but first of all, let me tell you a personal story uh, about one of my most memorable feedback. So it happened a couple of years before. Uh, I worked <clears throat> for another company, and I was there actually a team lead. I just became a team lead, and I wanted to ship the best quality software what we could and how you can achieve it if you try to do everything on your own. So I tried to control everything from support, from operation, and whatever I could. Of course, I was very frustrated and the, the quality wasn't that good as I expected. So I actually as went uh, to my manager and I was complaining to him that how frustrated I am and what, what a situation I, I am. And he just told me, well, it's your fault because you should have the leg it. And I hated this answer, to be honest. But later I realized he was right because as a team lead, my job is to help my team to produce quality product and not doing everything because I can do it, definitely. Why I told you this story? Because I do believe in that. If you have a data engineering team, and then data engineering team should not spend whole of their time operating or running your platform and owning all of the uh, data pipelines, but more empowering th those people who are using your data to be able to own uh, the data pipelines and actually operating uh, and, and try to delegate uh, the operation of your platform as much as possible. But first of all, uh, you're, what is data in my perspective? Because you heard that a couple of times, I mean, you heard from uh, Zoltan the data word a couple of times, but what is data in my context? Basically, uh, the majority of, of the data what we are collecting are applic application logs. What kind of logs? When I'm going uh, from back and forth in this presentation, it generates logs. If you are checking on your mobile phone, the presentation, it will generate logs. Even though you were offline, when you became online, your, uh, your mobile application will send the logs to us. We are collecting these logs. We are basically using Scribe, which is a, an open source solution from Facebook. Uh, it, it, it is deprecated, so don't use, but it works for us. And we are collecting the logs, and actually, and in every hour, we are shipping to S3. We are LZ complex, uh, compressing the logs and act actually doing uh, LZ indexing on it to be able to split those files. But we are not 
only collecting application logs because we have servers. Service generates logs. We are also collecting those. And of course, we have third party providers, right? payment providers, because our analysts are interested on those in, uh, data. We are also moving those to S3. And of course, we have a couple of other third parties, and even we collecting database dumps if, if, it's, if it needed. But uh, how we started the whole data uh, engineering team and this whole data at Prezi? So the data team was funded basically five years ago. We had nothing that time. So we had only two data engineers, one data analyst, and they used uh, what they had. Can you guess? Uh, and uh, so they use actually one of the most popular data crunching tool. Can you guess what? Actually, basically what you have on the Linux systems. So they, they were hardcore engineers who wrote very heavy uh, bash scripts or they went production databases if they needed data from that. And it was, in one way, it was pretty cool because you, you didn't have to operate anything. But uh, actually, it was an issue that even for one analyst, the two engineer was a bottleneck because the analyst couldn't write, see, uh, couldn't go directly to the production database and couldn't write uh, bash scripts. So he had to ask those data engineers to do it for, them, for him. And as we had started to have more and more data, it even happened that uh, they killed production services. And when you are building a data platform or a data team, you want that people uh, recognize your team. But this is not the thing what you want, believe me. So OK, we started to think, OK, what to do next? Of course, what we, what we decided to do, let's run our own Hadoop cluster. Use Hadoop. It's pretty cool. We, have, we are using Chef for configuration management. It's very easy to start in EC2 nodes and starting your own Hadoop cluster and, and managing it. Is there anybody who, has, who are not using managed Hadoop, but they are operating their own Hadoop cluster? Oh, cool. Do you like to operate it? <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's, that's happened with us. So there are two data engineers, and they spent all of their time just to keeping alive the cluster. So basically we put hoops in the Hadoop operations. <laughs> okay, so we are there, we, we need to do something. So we decided it was a logic decision because uh, we are on Amazon, let's try out EMR. But we didn't want, to be, we, we wanted to hide the actual implementation so that we are using EMR from our users. So we came up with the following architecture. Uh, on the top, you can see AWS API. Basically, if you want to start a cluster or, or you, if you want to do anything with the cluster, you are using the AWS API. We created a service uh, which called a REST service, which called Hadoop Status Server. Uh, this is basically a REST interface where all of their tools are interacting. If so, and actually this Hadoop status server which interacts the AWS API. And we have the gateway node, which basically where our users can log in, and if they want to interact with the Hadoop cluster, they can uh, run commands there, and we have wrapper commands which communicates with the Hadoop status server. But how, how this looks like in reality? So let's say you want to run a cluster, and you can you just need to log into the gateway node. You just basically enter a command like create cluster and entering how many nodes do you have, do you want, and add the name to it. Let's say user cluster one. So this is pretty easy. And let's say you want another cluster, but in this case uh, you want uh, you set it as a default cluster. Default cl if you tag a cluster as a default cluster, then if you fail to uh, add the name when you are running uh, some kind of, uh, so basically how this works, you set an environment variable and if you run one of the command like big or hive, then based on the environment uh, variable, 
it uh, knows which cluster uh, you want to go. But if you set something as a default cluster, then if you fail to add any, uh, set any environment variable, then you go end up uh, at the default cluster. So in an example how this works, uh, a, user, a user logs in to the gateway node, and he or she enters, let's say, a Hive command. So on the gateway node, we have a wrapper command, which is actually a Hive command, but actually a Hive command is not, won't run there, because a Hive command first goes to Hadoop status server, and it asks for the master node uh, IP address. It, the Hadoop status server actually uses the AWS API to get the master node address, and actually it caches it, so even if uh, the AWS API is down, we still can log in uh, to the master node. It ha happened with, uh, for us uh, a couple of times, uh, a few times actually, so it's pretty useful if you try to cache the cluster address. So then when the Hadoop set, status service gives back the ad IP address, then we SSH into that machine and actually it runs the command which all, with all the parameters and actually we are shipping, so if you're running pig, the pig script and actually if you have a uh, hive query from the command line, then the HQLFI. So this is basically how works currently this infrastructure. But moving to EMR, we had a few challenges. Uh, one of the main challenges was that uh, we can't store anything in HDFS because if you want to upgrade your EMR cluster, you need to uh, stop it, start, and you lose whatever you had on HDFS. So what we could do, we just moved everything to Amazon S3. What does it mean? So all the input data when we are doing any transformations are on S3, and when Hadoop the, does the, the data crunching in the end, it will move the end result into S3, and only the temporary data are on HDFS. And the second issue that we are on the US East one uh, zone where actually S3 is eventual consistent. So what does it mean? It can even happen that you uh, delete a file and create the same file and it will say, say to you that, hey, this file already exists. What you can do on EMR and actually for EMRFS, there is this consistent view. What basically it does, it monitors uh, what you are doing with the S3, and it makes sure that it, it will be consistent. It works fine if you are, doing, if you are interacting with S3 only uh, uh, through EMRFS. But in our case, sometimes people are using S3 CMD, and if you are uh, not working with the, with the S3 through EMRFS, you can easily end up in an inconsistent state. So we just decided, okay, just live with it. It's not a big issue because if something, if, if it happens that it will say to us that, hey, this guy still, still exists, uh, we will retry it the next time. And it's way less pain what we had earlier when we tried to uh, solve this invention consistency issue. And the third one, we can, want, wanted to use Hive. And if you're using Hive, you have a Hive a meta store. So if you are creating external tables, uh, then in the high meta store, you, there, there will be those tables. But if you are stopping a cluster and starting a new cluster, you will lose the, the, those high meta store. But we didn't really want it this. So we, we wanted to find some kind of solution. So even if we are starting a new cluster, uh, we shouldn't, we, we didn't want it to recreate the whole hive table, all the Hive tables. So we use Amazon RDS in a, in a, as an external Hive meta store. So anytime we are stopping a cluster or starting a new cluster, it, it will see the, the same tables there. And uh, it's also pretty cool that you are starting a parallel cluster, then it will show the same state as well. And what were the benefits? The first, that you have a disposable Hadoop cluster, so it's pretty easy to upgrade because you just basically uh, start a new cluster, 
sets that new cluster is a default cluster and stops the, uh, the old cluster, and user, user, users uh, won't even recognize that there is a new cluster. And from operation perspective, if you have any issue with that, first we just stop it, start a new one, and let's see if it works now. But usually it helps. And a second benefit was that anybody can run their own cluster, which is pretty cool because it's, sometimes it happens that analysts want to run a backfill back to two or three years, and they can really uh, overwhelm or a default cluster. So in this case, they can run their own cluster, and the default cluster uh, won't be affected. So basically, the operation part, we delegated the operation part to Amazon, and we, we were very happy with that. And actually, we got back two or four data engineers who spent their whole time just operating a cluster. And uh, we ended up, basically, this is our current data infrastructure, what you can see there. So logs going to S3, and on S3, we are doing data manipulations uh, with Hive or Pig, and then the, data, uh, the transform data goes to S3, and those, uh, then, then after that, we, try, we, we are loading to Amazon Redshift, and then we have a self-service charting tool. This is Chart.io, which is pretty cool because uh, our users can create their own charts without the help of any data engineer. And we have this Prezi Analytics, which is only for the KPIs, so the management and finance can check, that, check uh, those most important charts. Yeah, sorry. So, but if you have a chart, you want to update it uh, regularly because it's not a chart which you create once and then it stays there forever. To do this, uh, you want to do all of this transformation in the right order. So, so having on S3 the data, then doing the data manipulation, then loading to Redshift, and then having the chart. To do, to do this, you need some kind of tool which makes sure the dependency, so, so which makes sure that the order will be always the same. But if you have more and more data pipelines, then this dependency will be more and more complex. So we were looking for some kind of workflow or ETL tool three years ago, uh, what would uh, help us in this situation. And we checked that time the open source solution and we couldn't find uh, a right one for us. So we bought the other own solution, which called Flowkeeper. It handles all the dependencies, which I think all of the open source solution can do, and we could do at that time as well. But our main problem is that uh, our analysts really, they, they like to write SQL, but they don't really like to write code. So we had to come up with some kind of solution where they can easily create uh, data sets but without the help of us, because we didn't want it to own all of the data sets and all of the data pipelines. So we came up with a very, uh, so we did this very simple JSON descriptor where you can basically define what's your input, what's your output. And I would like to point that out that there are no explicit S3 URLs because we wanted to hide from the users. Because uh, with this, we can change those URLs. So we can change the data, they, they can't really see it. And uh, another important thing, I think, in the end, so for every job, we have an owner. In this way, if something breaks or if something goes wrong, we can go to those, that, those uh, person and ask them, OK, fix this, or what's happening there. So it seemed simple, but as we started to have more and more job, we had more and more issue with this. The first one was that, so there were jobs or data pipelines which are more important right, uh, like the others. Like, let's say, if you have a KPIs what you are generating, uh, and, and, and all of the analysts want to work with that early in the morning, but there are some kind of other data, but actually it, people only checking I don't know, once a week, and, and if you don't have a correct priority, then it can happen that, that your KPIs will be ready late afternoon, 
so people can't work that time. So we added a priority handling into it, and uh, we had another issue that it also can happen uh, as you have more and more jobs, that there are no dependency between uh, those jobs, and those will run in parallel on the same resource. So it, it happened that time that we, are, we tried to run some kind of redshift load, and actually because there was, I don't know, 10 of jobs which were not depending on each other, those were running uh, at once uh, on Redshift. So we basically put into uh, resource management where we can set, okay, how many parallel loads can run on Redshift, how many uh, data manipulation can run on Hadoop, etc. But to be honest, today I would not write my own solution. There are pretty cool open source solutions like Luigi or Airflow. So I do recommend if you are in this situation like we, then try to use one of them and build your uh, infrastructure over that. So people started to use uh, our uh, workflow tool, and I will show what's the uh, best example that people like that. Wow, this. So you can imagine how easy to figure out if something breaks into this system. So this is, this is a thing what, what you don't want to own, for sure. But, but you know, if, 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 if you don't give any help to your analyst or the people who are working with the data, they will always come to you to help to, to debug, okay, what went wrong, what happened there, and why my data is not there. So we, we came up with a tool called Datadoc to be able to figure out what's happening inside or to be able to find your data. I think this is pretty important and uh, mostly people are talking about technical issues and how to solve it. But I think it's, so if you want the self-service data, one of the most important thing to give something to your users to be able to find the data, where it is. As you can see, basically how it works, it's like a Wikipedia. You just enter some kind of word, like user, it will list you uh, all the tables or inputs or uh, and everything uh, where, where it, these words are, and you can select, okay, which is a user table. We are crawling Redshift every day for new tables, and we are crawling all the ETI jobs uh, every day, and uh, this is what we use for building these databases. And as you can see there, you can see, okay, which job depends on this data set and what other jobs creates this data set. And actually, even you can go to, to that link uh, in the bottom to see the actual job. So, so far, so good. But if you find a, a data set, which is like a user table, without the correct definitions and about knowing uh, what the different columns are for, you can't really use it. So what we did, we didn't want it, to be honest, uh, to being, uh, to documenting on our own all of the data sets, so we provided this kind of tool, and that's why I told you that it's like a Wikipedia, where people can go and they can basically document uh, the data sets. So if you own a data set, you can document it, you can uh, com put comment for every uh, columns. So if somebody wants to work with your data sets, then they just need to go to the system and look for that. So, so far so good, but, but like if you have a, 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 a service, you want to monitor it. And this is the same uh, true for data sets. So this is the worst thing that can happen. If, if, I don't know, some kind, there is some kind of dis discrepancy in your data set, and you only realize when you are showing it to the board or, or for your manager. So we provided a tool for our users to be able to create alerts, because we, as a data engineering team, we didn't want it to check all of the data sets, and we have no idea if, you know, if this is a discrepancy or not. But anybody who owns a data set, they can create uh, alerts for that, and we are providing a tool. Uh, so basically what we are doing here, from the previous year's data, we try to guess with a threshold where the data should be. It's very primitive, but it works in most of the case, especially if there is a huge spike in your data. 
so in this way, we just empowered our users to own a data set or a data pipeline without a need of data engineering, which is, I think is pretty useful, uh, pretty cool, because we, as data engineers, we would like to work more on improving a platform and, and, uh, and not operating or owning all the data sets, because it's not possible. Especially in our case, we have around 800 uh, the, uh, ETL jobs in our system, so it's nobody really can, can oversee those. So two of my recommendation uh, is one, try to delegate the operation as much as possible to, to Amazon or whoever you can, and to, have, uh, to, be, uh, to provide your users end-to-end -end responsibility over uh, their data sets. Because if you provide that, people will like to, and uh, not like, but they will own data sets or data pipelines. And in the end, just a quick recap what you heard about. So this up there, you can check the Prezi. And you heard about how to store uh, a tons of small, uh, small uh, object on S3. You heard about how to store not that much, but big objects, and how to do secret management on S3, and how to run a data platform, or how we run the data platform to not drown in the support and operation. And I think it's time for the questions. So Tan can come up, and if you have any question, feel free to ask it now. There are two microphones, or just find us here, or later today, or tomorrow, or on email, or Twitter, or whatever, or whatever you like. Thank you.